What do we know about the Omicron variant so far? I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. Just when you thought that we were catching a break, that perhaps we were at the light at the end of the tunnel, a new variant appears. The world is going through a rapid resurgence in COVID cases. Within Canada, more specifically, records have been breaking almost every day. Now, I did express before I was tired of talking about COVID. I couldn't talk about it every week because it seemed to be always something new to discuss, but the general populace had the gist of it. We're in the pandemic, take precautions, and try to hunker down. But Omicron poses some new changes that are worth discussing. The first item that it highlighted to everyone is the ineptitude of our government when it comes to testing. They've openly admitted that they simply can't keep up. The amount of people who need a test right now far surpasses their capacity to process and even get them the test to begin with. This is quite disappointing because we've been in this pandemic for going on two years now, and we still haven't figured it out. Testing, availability, and a lack of the rough has been a problem since the dawn of COVID-19, and still is an issue today. And why is that posing challenges? Well, the biggest hurdle here to overcome is that without proper testing, the public can't get an accurate reading for what's really going on. Do we just have 10,000 cases in our province, or is it more like 50? Is it more like 100? Having testing easily and readily available to people, having a system in place so that they can test at home and still report to the government, these things would do tremendous good. And further, what if you do have some type of symptoms? Is it a common cold? Is it allergies? Well, if you can't get tested, you don't know. And what if you do have to do something like go out to the grocery store, or whatever other activity you have to take part in. If you can't find a test to confirm if you are COVID positive or not, people might be taking risks they need not do if they were sure about their status. There are various other ways the government has dropped the ball when it comes to handling the pandemic, and that itself is quite astonishing. It's not like this is the first pandemic the human race has ever had to endure. They happen quite frequently, or at the very least at frequent intervals. It seems like every 70 to 100 years, one is popping up. It's not of a playbook established by now to not have common protocols to fall back on. That's an error. And hopefully this will be the lesson that we need to plan accordingly going into the future. So moving on to Omicron itself, what are the origins of this virus? Well, it seems like it originated from South Africa, but even there, there is some debate. It's likely or even possible that another region actually was the host of Patient Zero, but... Perhaps they weren't testing as frequently, and once it came to South Africa, that's when it was detected. So maybe it's better to say that this virus was first detected in South Africa, but the actual origins of it are more murky. Well, now moving past that, patient zero, who was it? Do we know for sure? We don't, but there are some clues here. Now, the common theory is coming from the fact that this variant has a huge number of of new mutations. It's actually out of the ordinary. People are speculating that for that to occur, the virus would have to have been inside a host that was not killing it off, and it had that opportunity to continue to mutate over a vast span of time. Now, if you catch COVID, it's either you're going to die from it, or you're going to kill it. But there are people who are immunocompromised, but they're receiving treatment to deal with the infection or the virus but they haven't particularly taken care of the entire thing due to that lacking immune system. Somebody who is HIV positive fits that bill. An immune system in that context is just not up to the task of handling the COVID infection within the body. It can muster up perhaps some defense, but not enough to eradicate it. Now, COVID will continue to mutate and grow, passing on its genetic material onto the next generation, and this thing can replicate very quickly. It's the process of evolution right before your very eyes. And if it's allowed to do that, to essentially replicate itself and create generations upon generations of this virus without being disturbed by outside causes, and if it can achieve the, the feat of not killing its host, because then it wouldn't be able to reproduce anymore, well, that's a perfect recipe for a new variant to appear, and a new variant with a astounding number of mutations on it. I believe it's something like 20% of the populace in South Africa does have to deal with HIV, 
So these criteria combined with the low vaccination rates and whatnot seem to point in the direction of this being the case. This is what led to the emergence of Omicron, and it does point towards what we should be doing in the future. If we're not looking to have any radical evolutions of COVID-19 in the short term, perhaps exploring how to better protect those vulnerable groups like HIV-positive people and other individuals with immunity compromisations, that could be a good strategy for the whole world to get behind. Otherwise, we could be sitting ducks and waiting for the next Omicron Part 2 to pop up. Now, some of the characteristics of this variant are quite shocking. It seems to be a super spreader in and of itself. It's believed to be far more contagious than any other form of COVID that we've seen. In fact, some of the data is showing that it's spreading at a rate of 70 times more than something like Delta or the previous ones that came before it. Now, that clearly is a bad thing, but there is a decent thing here to balance it out. Early reports are indicating that it's less able to penetrate deep lung tissue. And speculatively, for that reason, there is a considerable reduction in the risk of severe disease requiring things like hospitalization for people. So, just to recap, far more spreadable, but not producing as severe of an outcome as something like Delta, for comparison. Now, of course, this is just based on the data that we're seeing at the moment. Omicron is still new, this could change, but right now there are some cause for gratitude if you want to call it. This could have been dramatically worse. Imagine a combination of something that is far more spreadable and far more deadly. What if instead of not being able to penetrate as deeply into lung tissue, it was able to penetrate more deeply into deep lung tissue? Well, then we'd really be in a predicament. Now, despite what I've said here, the seemingly less severe outcomes, we may still face a dramatic problem as a community. It's simply a matter of sheer volume that we're dealing with now. And here's an example. So let's say you have a group of 100 people. And something like Delta would spread to 10 of them. Delta, less spreadable, but more severe. So maybe 1 out of that 10 is going to be hospitalized. So 1 in 10 from Delta are going to get sick. Now, imagine something like Omicron. It seems to be something that's dramatically more spreadable. So let's say that instead of 10 people being infected, we have 70. Now, with Delta, you can presume in this hypothetical that 1 out of 10 would be hospitalized. In real life, it's actually a lot less than that. Your odds of being hospitalized by any COVID strain is something closer to 1% in Canada, but leave that aside for now, right? Let's say that Omicron has a likelihood of sending you to the hospital at half of that. It's going to be 1 in 20. Well, if you had to choose at an individual level, yeah, you'd want the Omicron variant if you had to pick your destiny here, just because for you it's less likely that you'll become hospitalized, but if it's going to infect 70 people, well, 1 out of 20 will get sick, so let's just make it easy here. Round it down to 60 people, three of them are going to go to the hospital. On a per person basis, yeah, you're better off, but collectively, the hospitals could easily be overrun here. Simply due to the fact that more people are going to get sick, even if there is a less proportion of them, comparatively so to Delta, who are individually going to need that treatment, the scale is just far beyond what we might be prepared for. It really is a question of trade-offs here, and you can think of it in a game theory sense. With Delta, less spreadable, higher rate of hospitalization. With Omicron, more spreadable, lesser rate of hospitalization. Now you have to add on to the fact that the healthcare workers themselves, given that Omicron is more spreadable, are at a greater risk. And that's another problem. What if these staff begin to get sick? Who's going to work in these ICUs and these hospitals? What protections can we give them? If any, that can make it a safer environment. That's something we have to watch out for. Our staffing levels were already critical across most of Canada. And you add on to the fact that many provinces fired unvaccinated practitioners. The staffing levels were even lower than they should have been. Now, there are pros and cons to doing that, laying off or putting on leave those who are unvaccinated, but in the medical sense, it's always been a gray area for me. On one hand, you do have these staffing shortages that were very clear from the get-go. On the other hand, it's probably better if the staff are vaccinated. Resorting to getting rid of them, though, amidst a pandemic where we need healthcare workers, 
that was always iffy for me. And Omicron is tipping the hand there. Why? Well, simply put, it has an ability to evade both double vaccination and the body's immune system. Now, in other words, if you have a medical nurse or doctor who's double vaxxed and someone who's unvaxxed, Omicron could very easily be spreading at comparable rates between the parties there. Now, I'm not saying the situations are entirely alike. The double vaxxed practitioner might have a reduced risk of getting hospitalized themselves, but when it comes to transmittability, the data is currently showing there isn't much of a difference there, and that's actually what we're primarily concerned about in the hospital setting. And I know governments are catching on to this too, because amidst these concerns of all the staff getting sick and the already crippled number of people who are here working in the first place, they've reached out to those who were laid off due to their vaccine status and they're inviting them back. In short, it's unclear to me if your doctor is double vaxxed or not vaxxed at all, whether or not their transmittability would be all that different. And if it's not all that different, it may have been a bad idea to get rid of them in the first place given what we know about Omicron. Now, to caveat that, the booster shots are another variable to consider. How about a healthcare worker who is triple vaxxed? Well, they might have a reduced risk of transmittability and severe outcomes, that's all possible. The data just isn't in yet, so we'll see how that plays out there. But still, the fact of the matter is we don't want our hospitals to run out of people to take care of those who are seriously ill. And I'm willing to hear any solutions that we have to that problem. If there was going to be one fail point that could catastrophically hamper our ability to contain the pandemic, staff at hospitals would be it. So now let's say that you think you've contracted Omicron. As we've talked about, on an individual basis, your odds of becoming seriously ill are reduced, seemingly, based on the current data, than if you had caught Delta or something like that. And the most common symptoms are cough, fatigue, congestion, and runny nose. And we talked about, you know, the confusion that can arise when someone's trying to figure out, do I have a cold? Is it allergies? Is it COVID? Well, these milder symptoms, you can call them, are going to make that confusion much worse. Because something like a cough or runny nose or congestion are common across many other airborne illnesses. So I guess my message here would be don't panic, try to get tested, and if you do have any symptoms, whether or not you can differentiate them between a cold or COVID, it's better for you just to quarantine and lock down for those two weeks. So before we end today, I want to touch on something else that the government has fumbled, and that is the vaccine rollout. The provinces differ across Canada, but many of them open them up to everyone 18 plus without ensuring that those most vulnerable were served. This was complete madness in my opinion, and it was driven by the public. There are many people protesting that they wanted their booster now, and in my eyes it was a very selfish movement. So, think about everything we've talked about here. I'm going to add another factor to consider. The first is that COVID does not hit all groups equally. There are those who are more vulnerable, like we talked about, those who have an immunity compression, those who are obese, those who are older. These groups are high risk, and if you catch COVID as a fit 20-year-old or an obese 70-year-old, the outcomes here are going to be drastically different. I've been hearing from people who are elderly, who do have illnesses that would compromise them if they caught COVID, those who are heavier and stuff like that, who struggle to find these booster shots. This was a failure at the governmental level to not account for these things that are so easily predictable. Once you open the floodgates, everyone is going to be running towards these boosters. We needed to administer them in a logical fashion. Underlying all of this is also the fact that we don't want our hospitals to collapse. And if those who are most vulnerable, if those most likely to need hospital treatment if they catch COVID, are not getting all the protection they need, we're walking towards a cliff here. Then there's also the reverse problem of these unscientific factors for vaccine prioritization. I'm not too sure about the boosters, but definitely during the first and second shots. This was, in my opinion, quite crazy. To have on that priority list, so some of those factors made sense, right? Like the elderly, people who are going through chemotherapy because their immune system would be suppressed. All of that, perfectly fine. 100% agreed. But then they add something in there. Like, if you are native. Well, let's explore that. 
Does simply being native make you more at risk of a dire consequence of COVID-19? The answer is no. At least there isn't any data to point towards that. Well, what does then? If you live on a reserve, sure. That actually could be a factor. Why? Because presumably you're going to be far away from a hospital that can take care of you. So an outbreak at a reserve is going to be more dire than an outbreak in Toronto, for example. But the thinking can't stop here. What other communities have commonalities with a reserve? It's actually any remote community. Any remote community who is far away from a properly equipped hospital is going to suffer if they're hit with a COVID outbreak. So why couldn't that criteria then be those in remote communities and include reserves on it? Something like that would disproportionately help those natives who are on the reserves because they qualify anyways. But when you have this unscientific approach of putting a race category there, you can have someone who's native living in Toronto, who is a fit 20 year old, getting their first shot sooner than maybe the 50 year old, who is definitely at a greater risk given their age and whatever other problems they might be having. I've seen this occur across many other dimensions as well with various other programs. People are resorting to using politically correct proxies for problems that need not have them. If you just use the actual metric that you're trying to go for, like remote communities, you would disproportionately help the groups you want to help anyways, and you would include everyone else who could be being adversely affected there. It's mind-boggling, and these same people will then say that they're following the science, and it's clearly not the case when you're administering faux criteria. So on one hand, with something like the booster shots, you have a terrible choice and you're lacking criteria. But then you rewind the clock back to things like our first dose and second dose rollout, and you have the pseudo criteria. The government has fumbled a lot of things here. And I will also mention too, there is a way to be scientific and still incorporate racial criteria when it makes sense. For example, there was a report that something in the South Asian genome made them more susceptible to, I believe it was Delta. Something about the genetic code that they have doesn't react well to this virus. And sure, the data, if it shows that, then I'm all for prioritizing that group. Just because we know that they are literally more susceptible to the virus based on a genetic component there. That's very different than attributing something like the remoteness of a group to the entire group. What we know doesn't apply evenly there. Something like a genetic disposition to a bad outcome is very different. And we have to understand that. So now looking towards the future, what are we dealing with? Now, there is some silver lining. The first is, given the fact that Omicron is rapidly eating through the entire population, it could burn itself out. This could be a springboard to get us to something like herd immunity. With all the people getting infected at record levels and all the natural immunity that they will get after that, and the increasing vaccine rollouts and booster shots, this could be the catalyst that gets us to the end game here. Hopefully. Now, another thing to consider is that we do have something to be thankful for, as we talked about. Now, of course, this could change, but just based on the initial data, it does look like things are not as bad as they could have been. There is any number of mutations that could have made the Omicron virus more deadly to people and more spreadable. Currently, it doesn't seem to be close to that. It's definitely more spreadable, and that's going to cause a strain on the healthcare system, but on a per-person basis, it's definitely not the worst thing. So, there is some optimism, cautious optimism, to be clear, to have here. Now, we'll see how things play out, and I will keep you up to date on the latest on the matter. Now, with that, it does bring us to the end of our conversation for today. If you enjoyed the content, be sure to leave a review and share. that help us grow. And you can find me online at periplatform.org and on social media at periplatform. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you soon.